I've been working in various ways in the food business for over 25 years, from hands-on cooking to marketing, brand development, and education. Food and cooking is a big part of my daily life. It's my profession, it's a big part of my social life, and my travel interests. Apparently, I am not alone. Restaurants, home cooking, farming, food provenance, celebrity chef, and various food movements currently receive what seems like unprecedented attention in North America and I expect in Australia and other countries as well. Our food TV is awash in reality cooking shows, programs including diners, drive-ins and dives, subjects of like food carts, restaurant makeovers, and lots and lots of culinary travel. Chef challenges have become major fundraising events. Celebrity chefs and recipes from famous restaurants seem to dominate cookbook publishing. Localism, freshness, and regionality are front and center in much of food-focused discussion, debate, and entertainment. And of course, these issues are a huge factor in the development of gastro-tourism. Sometimes these issues are discussed as if they're brand new concerns. Over a hundred years ago, the CPR created an internationally acclaimed signature cuisine based on regional and local Canadian products, but influenced by international standards of service, techniques, and recipes. The CPR created Canada's earliest mass tourism and travel opportunities for people who were not wealthy. Many people in Canada got their first taste of fine dining or introduction to haute cuisine in Canadian Pacific dining cars or hotels. This cuisine was executed on a huge scale under extremely difficult conditions. The CPR created a culinary brand which transmitted larger issues of Canadian cultural identity, history and heritage. It's still recognizable even though the real heyday of train dining ended over 80 years ago. It occurred to me that the creation of the railway style of food had something to say about Canadian origins of fine dining, the marketing value of cuisine, and about 21st century food-based tourism, as well as about Canada. I decided I wanted to investigate exactly how early dining car meals were designed, executed, managed, and marketed as my dissertation for the Master of Gastronomy from the University of Adelaide. I was interested in the micro level. Who was in charge? Where did the recipes come from? Where did the food come from? Who cooked and how? What were the culinary influences and what can they tell us about cuisine today? How do they relate to current questions about food, cooking, and eating? I had seen many historical menus from the CPR as well as from railways in the U.S., and they were my starting point. I contacted the archives to ensure that I would get permission to explore specific archival material that would help reveal what I wanted to know. Canadian Pacific has an enormous history and role in the formation of Canada as a nation. There are thousands of books, academic and popular articles and studies, government reports. The story of the Canadian Pacific is a story of Canadian nation building, politics, immigration, history, agriculture, economy, and of course, tourism and the giant personalities involved in all these things. We study it in school, in museums, in public libraries, university and government programs, on the web, and in music and Canadian fiction. It's just an enormous body of work. The CPR archive holds the company documents and materials relating to CP business, history, and development. The archives are private, but permission may be granted to researchers. The CP website currently gives access to various historical photographs and graphic arts from the archive and general information particularly geared to students. My particular interest in the dining cars and cuisine was a minute part of the archival collection, 
But even so, I found a wealth of material, including menus, advertising materials, internal staff bulletins and training manuals, recipes, reference books, statistics about annual consumption of meat, eggs, and various other products, annual reports, photographs and letters, and personal anecdotes. There was more than enough to tell me quite a fascinating story. I was fortunate to have a very knowledgeable and generous guide named Joanne Colby, who had been employed by the archive for a number of years. I think my particular topic was sort of interesting to her, and she really got into the swing of things, sort of digging things out and making suggestions. I can only assume the materials related to the other fields of study or investigation are equally massive. I enjoyed nothing but a huge level of support and interest. My particular finds included information about how menu dishes were chosen and created. I found the French reference cookbooks and also some American ones of the day and clues to the creation of recipes, which all had to be standardized to create a consistent quality and level of service. This came from internal bulletins, some of them staff bulletins, about the head of passenger services, about or from the head of passenger services, a man named H.W. Cooper. He was neither a chef nor a cook. He was a systems expert. And he managed to distill the essence of French, American, British, and, of course, Canadian food and dishes, including cooking techniques, ingredients, instructions, into very simple language and format. Dining car staff did not have formal French training. Some of them didn't speak French. They were not necessarily trained chefs at all, but they were trained by the CPR. Cooper created a handbook, which he referred to as, quote, the brains of cooks systematized. Isn't that great? It contained recipes, portion guidelines, sliding price scales, service protocols, and more for all the dishes served. Cooper's name appeared at the bottom of most menus with an invitation to write to him with uh, suggestions or, I assume, complaints. And he also used the menus to address customers directly. For example, during the war, he informed passengers that, quote, in the interest of food conservation, veal, little chickens, young lambs, little pigs, and their byproducts are not used in the Canadian Pacific Service, end quote. This was written across the bottom of the menus. Menus also came with a free envelope to mail home, a sort of postcard. I think it was just great marketing, and it seemed to have a personal touch that certainly is lacking today. I did get a big surprise on one visit. Joanne Colby took me down to the basement of the CPR building in Montreal, which is quite large. There used to be a train station upstairs, and she walked me through corridors to a locked room. We went in. On the shelves were, the shelves were filled with embossed china and silver from the dining cars, just shelves and shelves of stuff. Silver coffee services, salt cellars, cutlery, silver domes of varying sizes that covered plates to keep them warm. I was dazzled, especially when she assured me that this was only a fraction of what was there originally. Evidently, one of her first jobs was to catalog the dining room car utensils. I have a bit of a passion for outsized silver cutlery, and I was rather disappointed to learn that I had missed a big public sale the year before. I think there's very delicious food to be had on today's luxury, quote, gourmet trains, albeit at a very high price. I certainly would not say the same about regular passenger trains, but on these t gastro tourism trains, yes. But I think it's very difficult to bring something new to the game. It's hard to create a signature cuisine with people who really have seen it all before. I think that tourist providers in the gastronomic or gourmet niche today 
have to take into account and deal with the expectations of a diverse group of people who are already used to almost unlimited selection, um, including special choices for food allergies and diets, low fat and vegetarian options. Many of their ideas about dining are the product of a food culture depicted by television and the internet with a high entertainment factor. They often want to meet the chef, particularly if he or she is well-known or has been on a reality food show. They're well-traveled. When I read the menus on those trains, I feel like I'm reading a menu from any good restaurant, which has to be general and flexible enough to please the customer base while making a culinary statement, which usually includes some homage to local and regional foods. I think that's very different from the experience on the early dining cars, which introduced a new way of eating, provided a sense of magic to some people, really showcased Canadian products, and became a significant internationally known brand. The dining car experience, after a few years, was open to middle class ordinary people. This was on a passenger train going from town to town, not a luxury or adventure train that costs thousands of dollars a week. People today are very used to cho choice. They expect it, they demand it. Cruise ships offer huge variety and quantities of food, from snacks to fine dining, all sorts of ethnic specialties, theme-based buffets, and never-ending access. So perhaps that's one interpretation and experience of abundance and variety. It's possible that luxury trains in France or, say, in India offer cuisine unique to their countries with dishes representing the variety of regions in those countries. For tourists, at least for me, that cuisine and those meals would definitely be unique and exciting, although I expect that any real gastronomic railway experiences these days comes at quite a price. I do have one gastronomic travel experience that stays with me to leave you with. Many years ago, during the 90s, we took the ferry from Southern Ireland to Brittany. It was fall, it was very cold, and it was a French ship with French food and lots of it. Beautifully presented salads, bread, seafood from Brittany, classic meat dishes like beef bourguignon and others, and pastries, the formidable avalanche de dessert, all included in the price of a ticket. This was not a luxury ship. Gale force winds sent almost everyone to their chair or their cabins, including me. I ate nothing, but I've never forgotten the sight of that beautifully presented food, a contrast to what we'd been eating for the past few weeks, and the essence of the French approach to cuisine. It was served in gale force winds with water lapping at the portholes, and I wonder to this day if it's still available.